You ran a 266 on Irving B? Yeah. Just now. Huh. I thought it might dissuade him from spending so much time with Bert G. Hey guys, Pete here. Today I'll be talking about the fifth episode of Severance, which continues to be my favorite thing out there because it isn't afraid to grapple with unpleasant realities like that at the center of industry is dust. I think things made progress towards coming into focus in the grim barbarity of optics and design. And I came away from this episode thinking a lot more about the motivations of the employees who aren't severed. Plus, Bert, Irv, and Dylan make a great trio, and there were baby goats. I'll recap everything that happened and what I think it might mean right after this quick spoiler warning. If you haven't watched Severance Season 1, Episode 5 yet, then this video won't be for you. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. The opening sequence in the fifth episode is a fantastic examination of the transition from Innie to Audi. The previous episode ended with Helly's resignation request being denied and her making the decision to send the other version of herself an offer she can't refuse. You see her hanging by the neck, making the shift from Innie to Audi as the elevator goes up so that the latter struggles to get free as she realizes she can't breathe. Elsewhere in the basement, Mark looks pretty relaxed on his way back from his wellness session. Dylan is still in the office reading Rickon's book, and he hides it on his lap when Mark walks by. He goes to the elevator, and you see Grainer running in that direction at the same time. Mark finds Helly hanging limp when the door opens. He holds her and takes her down, and you can see that she's still breathing. Grainer forces him to get into the elevator, and he shifts to his Audi mode, forgetting what he just walked away from. The next morning, you see this in reverse as he shifts to being terrified about what happened to his co-worker. Milchek and Kobel are waiting there for him to arrive. To his surprise, Harmony tells him that her Audi has no intention of resigning and that she'll be back in her desk in a few days. She warns him that this happened on his watch and says he can thank Kier himself that it worked out the way it did. This sets up a montage where Mark is reading the book over the next couple of days. The quotes are fairly hilarious and it looks like his innie brain is gobbling the them right up. My favorite line was a society with festering workers cannot flourish, just as a man with rotting toes cannot skip. But they were all pretty good with a perfect reading and delivery. In her office, Grainer tells Koble that they ran the diagnostics on Petey's chip. He tells her that they found full synaptic coupling. Petey's memory was reintegrated. There's mention of her waiting before telling the board because of what just happened with Helly, and he realizes she hasn't told him about that yet. She wants to find out who reintegrated integrated PD so that she can take all the information to them at once. Audi Mark gets messages from Rickon telling him his sister is going into labor. In an effort to create a soul void because the fetus is drawn to clean air, Rickon shares the secret that he's upset that Mark hasn't called to thank him for his book yet. Because he never got it, they think it must have been stolen. Devin goes to grab coffee, leaving them alone together and giving them a chance to hang kelp. She sees another pregnant woman in the really big and expensive cabin next door, so she goes there to ask for coffee and gets invited inside by a new character whose name is Gabby. Devin asks if she's rich and considering this feels like a company town, you have to wonder if she isn't married to someone high up at Lumen. Maybe even someone who's on the board. We don't find out anything right at this point, but it seems like this character will come back one way or the other. When it's time to tell a secret the next time, Mark tells Devin he thinks Lumen might be up to something. He starts to tell her about Petey, but before he really gets any information out, she starts to have the baby. While that's happening, you see that the phone is still ringing in the box at his place, and that he does think about Petey's last moments when he saw him fall down outside the store. Back at the office, Milchek explains to Mark that Helly was in Audi form when she woke up, so when she comes down this time, it'll be the Innie's first conscious experience since the hanging. And she does wake up freaked out in the elevator. He assures her that they locked away the extension cords and other dangerous items so she'd be safe, and lets her know that if she wants to look for happy numbers for a while, that's fine. When he asks her if she wants to talk about it, she just walks away. Irv thinks they should try to help her by hiding 
writing inspirational handbook quotes around the office for her to stumble upon. Dylan thinks she just needs to start earning perks because he knows he would end his life if he didn't have his finger traps. Management has sent Miss Casey. She's there to watch Hallie and help her forgo any future suicide attempts. Upon request, she can even offer a hug. And Dylan throws it out there that he's been exhibiting signs of sadness, but she shoots his request down. She sits right behind Hallie and takes notes on everything that she does. During this period, we see Irv start to doze off again, where he sees the black goo dripping from the ceiling. When Mark looks over and says his name, he pictures him with goo coming out of one of his eyes, so that's probably something to remember. When he wakes up, he says he needs to go to O&D, and this sets off a sequence of events that all felt like they were bringing us closer to understanding what is happening on the severed floor. When he goes to the copy machine, it spits out a color painting of the violent coup Dylan brought up a few episodes ago. While he's looking at that, Milchek comes in and says that he sent them to the wrong printer by mistake and that Irv wasn't supposed to see them. He brushes it off as nothing, saying it's just a joke for Miss Kobel. Irv recognizes them as the coup and asks Milchek if it really happened. He says, of course not, nothing like that could happen here. And when he goes back to his office, Miss Kobel refers to it as a 266. Milchek says he thought it might dissuade him from spending so much time with Bert G. Then when he questions her about sending Miss Casey to watch Helly, she responds with the quote, the light of discovery shines truer on a virgin meadow than a beaten path. She says that she's trying something new with Miss Casey and tells him to keep it between the two of them. So there is a coordinated effort to keep the severed departments from fraternizing with each other. And you see how this works when Miss Casey tells Irv that Bert is in the conference room. He goes there right away to ask Bert what he's doing, and while he's explaining that he was just looking for him because he hadn't seen him, Dylan comes up and takes off his belt to lock Bert in. Irv freaks out, and when he can't find Mark and Helly, he comes back and asks Bert if he knows what happened to them. We've known what Dylan thinks about O&D, and then we saw the painting, which gave us an idea of where that came from. And from Bert, we learned that they don't trust MDR either. They have their own set of things that they don't like, and it involves them having pouches that they can carry their young in, their larval offspring that will jump out and attack if you get too close to them. And even though this is a joke, the sentiment holds. They don't like each other. He also adds that the larva eventually eats and replaces you, saying that that would explain Irving's youth energy and at this point Dylan realizes that they have feelings for each other and he does not approve because he's been conditioned not to trust them. Why it's important to keep the department suspicious of each other isn't clear and this is something I'll come back to at the end. They escort Bert back to O&D with his hands tied behind his back with Dylan's belt. There's talk about how relationships beyond the platonic are frowned upon and Bert asks if that's what they are. Irv never gives him an answer to this and they go inside to appreciate a painting of Kier meeting his wife at the factory they both worked at. And that gives Irv another chance to deliver one of his perfectly timed Kier quotes when he says they took heart to each other as colleagues. Dylan finds what he thinks is the same painting from the printout, but they realize that the roles are actually reversed in this version. And instead of being called the grim barbarity of optics and design where the episode gets its name, this one is called the macro data refinement calamity. And this makes the employees question why would there be two versions of the same painting. Mark and Helly take a mental health break slash field trip after she washes the makeup off that her Audi covered the marks on her neck with and he spilled his coffee to get Miss Casey out of the room. She isn't receptive to anything that he has to say at first and she leads him into parts of the floor we hadn't seen yet. Eventually she comes clean about how her Audi telling her she wasn't a person set her off. Mark tries to tell her not to focus on her and asks what she wants in here, the innie. And she tells him, what I want is for her to wake up as the life drains out of her body and to know it was me who did it. Before he can respond to that, they're interrupted to what sounds like a baby crying. They realize that it's coming from a baby goat and they follow it into a room where they see a man in a suit feeding them. And them is there's a bunch of them running around. He tells them they're not ready. You can't take them. And then he tells them to get the hell out of there. On their way out, she continues her role of being the audience surrogate by asking a question that would inevitably pass through every viewer's mind. I mean, what if the goats are the numbers? Is this department connected some way into what they're doing? 
Mark tells her that he knows that she doesn't want to be there, but he's glad that she is. And then she says that she'll clean up the map for him and they'll continue Petey's work. As Miss Casey finds them and is glad to find out they're both unhurt, we see that Miss Coble is watching all of this play out on her monitor. Grainer comes in to ask her if she's aware of what they're up to right now and wonders why she's not stopping it. She pulls out another Kier quote saying, the surest way to tame a prisoner is to let him believe he's free. Grainer acknowledges that there's a Kier quote for everything and wonders how many departments she's going to let them find. She doesn't say, but says that he can talk to her when when he finds out who hacked Kilmer's chip. Back at O&D, Bert brings Irv and Dylan into the back room and introduces them to everyone as being from MDR and says that they're friends. The episode comes to an end with him scanning the other employees for reactions as Irv is beaming and Dylan is suspicious behind him. I thought this was another dynamite installment, although I did find myself less engaged with the birthing retreat situation. Things that happen in the real world to Audi Mark feel a little less vital than what goes on at the office. It's not bad. Rickon is fun and I did feel like this Gabby character was leading somewhere, but it has trouble matching the office stuff which is just so sharp. Mark and Helly are becoming a team. I suppose that makes sense because Petey was his best friend and also seems kind of inevitable in hindsight considering how much he got on her nerves in the beginning. I do still think her transition probably isn't that much different than what the other people in MDR experienced when they first started. Then again, this situation at the beginning and knowing she chose to try to end her life to get back at her Audi, make her feel that and know it came from this entity that she didn't consider a person, that's probably on the extreme end of things. And that's going to be hard to top. Dehumanization is something people often do. But in this case, it's part of yourself. And she's fully aware and making a choice. This has led to a lot of theories about her Audi being someone important. A member of the Egan family. A careerist on the way up. Something along those lines. But I'm not really sold on that. It's possible. But I think there are similarities between her and Ian Audi. And I find the idea of these people making the choice to participate in this this program fascinating in and of itself. Irv and Bert are on the forbidden love path and it's a whole lot of fun watching these two actors play off each other. It's clever how their appreciation for Kier corporate mythology is what draws them together enough to overcome the department divide. There was a popular theory out there that Bert was trying to bring Irv in to be one of those permanently severed employees that Petey was talking about, but I think after this episode that falls apart. They seem like our example of what happens when innies wake up to their human need for companionship and plus the horniness. There are a few lingering questions around, like who hacked Petey's chip and is Mark ever going to answer his phone? Is the work they do actually important? And did the baby goats move the needle in one direction or the other? How many departments do we think there are and what's going on with the black goo? Will MDR and OND form an alliance and is that something that's happened before? As I mentioned in the beginning, I came away more focused on Kobol, Milchek, and Grainer, the unsevered. Also, Miss Casey continues to be weird, and I can't say I know what to think about her. I saw a few people wondering if she's a robot, and I can at least see where they got that idea. Initially, I thought there might be some amount of genuine care in the Mrs. Selvig-Mark relationship, but now I think she's just a Lumen super soldier. She has more quotes than Irv and Bert combined, and they have an excuse for for always using them. The idea that they're employing techniques to keep the employees from getting close has me wondering what is the overall goal? What are they trying to accomplish? Limited experience with other people would foster loyalty to the organization if that's all you have at your disposal. The way Rickon's contraband book is being devoured by everyone is a great example of this. Do they need an agenda beyond that? I'm not sure. Creating a cult of workers is something in itself, and it makes me wonder how long they've been trying to accomplish that and what other methods they would have tried before they had these implants at their disposal. That's kind of where my mind keeps wandering. 
I mean, it could be for profit, marketing the technology, it could be a psychological experiment, but when I think about how devoted Miss Coble seems to be without ever having the procedure done, thinking of things like that strange wall hanging in her living room, and the whole taking the drill to Petey's wake and pulling the chip out, maybe they're just trying to have everyone in their offices that dedicated. I really don't know, but I'm excited to see where it goes from here, and I think that's a good place to leave things. Let me know in the comments all the questions you have after this episode, what you're hoping to see in the next one, and your theories about what's happening and where you think it's going. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.